So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for participating in this um, uh, AI excellence lecture that's going to be delivered by Professor Jens Kober today. Uh, this uh, lecture series is part of the ITA program uh, for helping PhD students and postdocs to excel. Uh, AIDA is the International AI Doctoral Academy. Uh, some 73 European partners, uh, mostly universities, 55 universities, and then also research centers and top companies on AI in Europe joined uh, this initiative. Um, so we decided to open up our courses to each other, offer short courses and offer also uh, excellent lectures for primarily for PhD students and postdocs, so the level is expected to be high, but well, if you're a good uh, uh, undergraduate student, advanced fairly, and or if you are a master student, uh, or if you are an AI professional, you are welcome to enjoy those talks and uh, get the, the, the best out of it. Uh, you can have access to the PDF of the presentation. We're going to post a short video today. So it's our pleasure to have today Professor Kober, uh, that is from uh, Technical University of Delft. And uh, he's a system professor there. He has a, an excellent uh, career. So he's not that young anymore, but he's quite young <laughs> compared to me. Um, he got his um, awards for, for his PhD degree, and uh, more importantly, he got an ERC starting grant that gives him ample opportunities to excel his research. So, Jens, we hear you. You have about, let's say, three quarters of an hour presentation, and then we're going to have some uh, questions. Sounds good. Thanks a lot for the uh, very kind introduction and uh, especially also for the invitation. So uh, let me share my screen. I hope that's the right one. Yes, and indeed what I'm going to be talking about today is for good part actually about this ERC start starting grant. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about what the actual topic and, and the idea is in a minute. But before we do that, uh, let's just start with a few more general questions. So if we uh, typically think of robots, then the, the very obvious thing is they should help us. They should take over the dirty, dull and, and dangerous tasks or just help us out in a household environment. But if you look a bit closer and think a bit longer for it, and, or if you watch Star Wars or whatever, you're going to see that also quite often people have to help robots in order if they get trapped or even just help the robots learn and adapt to the environments they're in and then in the end actually help us. Similar question, who should teach whom? Uh, one way of thinking about it is, okay, maybe we can replace some of the teaching uh, by robots and have robots help us out to, with the uh, teaching. But what I'm going to focus on today is actually people teaching robots to do a task so that they can then help us um, to make our lives better and hopefully easier. What I'm working on is uh, mainly something called learning motor skills, uh, which are some form of movements on the order of a couple of seconds to a couple of minutes. So think about picking up an object and then uh, maybe preparing a cup of coffee or something like that. And for having robots learn it, there are two different and co but complementary ways of doing that, which are also inspired by how humans teach and learn. The first one is supervised learning in this uh, setting called imitation learning, where a teacher demonstrates a skill and then the student so the robot tries to mimic that that works well for fairly simple tasks but if you go for more complex tasks also robots need to practice so in machine learning terminology that would be reinforcement learning if we think about robots and learning you see a lot of work on the perception side um, recognizing objects places categorizing things. Um, I'm coming more from a control and mechanical engineering background. So I'm going to give you my take here, which is obviously a little bit biased. 
so if you want to apply robot machine learning to robotics, one of the things that makes it hard are complex dynamics. So think about frictions, uh, elasticity, things that are very hard to model analytically and hence also very hard to control in a more traditional form. Along with that, you have uncertainties and variations in the objects you want to interact with, in the environments, in the tasks the robot is supposed to do. And that all becomes even worse if you're considering interacting with humans that tend to be pretty unpredictable. And the thing is, as soon as we move out of the very classical domain of industrial robotics, where everything is nicely and cleanly separated and highly structured with the robots behind the fence here, um, that occurs in virtually all robot domains. So in agriculture and food production, where you have huge variations because it's a natural product in the tomatoes in this case, but also in the environment and background, things are growing, uh, it's raining, it's sunny and so forth. If you're thinking about directly interacting with people in a care environment or just even things like just cleaning up a messy kitchen. So even just learning these kind of interactions with objects and complex environments is very challenging. And then the other question is, how should a robot actually learn? If you take a look at what's been done very classically in motor skill learning in robotics is that you provide the robot with a lot of data, and maybe you give some demonstrations, or you provide a optimization criterion, and then the robot is off on its own trying to either mimic something or try to optimize um, a movement. If you compare that to how humans teach and learn, it's quite different. There you see that you actually have a continued student-teacher interaction where you have, for instance, additional demonstrations while the student is learning something or some other forms of intermittent feedback telling you, okay, that's going well, maybe try to do it slightly different, um, giving some positive or negative feedback. And that's one of the things that's largely missing in robot learning. We believe that actually introducing this intermittent interaction with the teacher while the robot is learning has lots of benefits and that it can speed up the learning process a lot, which in turn allows the robot to learn more complex tasks. And hopefully that's also an intuitive way for humans to teach. So that's exactly the topic of uh, my starting grant on figuring out how to best learn through interactions. But let me just start with uh, learning complex interactions. I'm going to start with uh, a very old example uh, on reinforcement learning. So I assume most of you are familiar with reinforcement learning. Should just to recap very quickly, the idea is that you are in a certain state. So for instance, that the robot is in a certain joint position, it applies an action. So for example, apply a certain motor torque, which obviously is going to change the state of the robot. So it's going to move it. And in every time step, you also get a reward signal. So that means you get a numeric signal on how well the robot is doing in that time instance. And then you can do that for multiple time steps until your task is done. What we're actually interested in learning is the policy, which is a form of a controller that tells you which action to take for which state. And then the objective is to maximize not the individual rewards you get in every time step, but in the simplest case, the cumulative average reward you get for the whole task. And then typically what you're going to learn is not this direct mapping, but rather a parameterized form thereof could be some regular basis functions representation, or nowadays it's probably going to be a neural network. So here's a very old example of that, learning to catch this little ball in the cup to help the robot a bit. We give it an initial demonstration. But if you just play that back, because it's pretty highly dynamic and the string dynamics are complex, it misses by a few centimeters. And then if you let the robot try different strategies, so now you're going to see an example where it's going a bit too far, it can figure out what works and what doesn't. So in this case, the reward is based on the distance between the ball and the cup and trying to minimize that so it goes in. 
And then roughly after 70 or so trials, it starts to get the ball in the cup. And after 100, it has converged. If you compare that to how long it takes a human to learn, that differs quite a bit between people, but on average, I'd say it's uh, like 20 times trying it or so. And then you get it in for the first time. Learning to do that reliably, that's a different question that can take quite a bit longer. So it's roughly in the same ballpark and uh, we were very proud of that. I'm going to come back to that example uh, a bit later to actually sh show you how having this interaction with a teacher during a learning process can really help to speed that up. For now, I'm just going to switch to imitation learning for a bit. So for the idea is that you observe what a teacher is doing and then the robot tries to mimic that. You're not really interested in just blindly playing back what the teacher was doing. That would be pretty trivial, but rather what you're interested in is actually being able to generalize to a new situation. So in this case, if you're going to pick up this glass of orange juice, uh, one demonstration might be to pick it up on the left side of the table and another one on the right side of the table. And then if uh, the orange juice is in the middle, then you don't want to have to give an additional demonstration, but rather the robot should have figured out that it's always supposed to move relative to the orange juice. What now happens is if you have multiple objects in there, so we not only have the orange juice, but also a coaster, or if we additionally want to figure out whether it's using position control or force control, it becomes more and more hard to figure out algorithmically what the correct thing to do is. Because also from simply from demonstrations, you sometimes can't disamb disambiguate that. So for instance, if you have this example down here where you want to use a sponge to clean something, if you push down, you can either describe it with a certain displacement, so a certain position, or with applying a certain force. If you always have the same object, then it doesn't make a difference. You can either use position control or force control, and it's going to result roughly in the same um, behavior. However, that then suddenly becomes important if you change something. So if you swap out the object, then it's really the question, should I maintain the offset or should I maintain the force I want to apply? So that's um, an example where this place, for instance, in a little sequence where we want to flip up this little box and then the next step would be to grasp it from the top because otherwise uh, the robot hand isn't able to grasp it if it needs to open that wide. So here you see a few different demonstrations and what we want to figure out is are we moving relative to that box or to the support or to the world frame? Are we applying a certain force or is it actually position control? And we also want to at the same time split it up into a little sequence of movements we are doing. So what we do is we collect a number of demonstrations, so around 10 in this case, and what we want to get out of the algorithm is a sequence of what we call movement primitives. So little um, sub parts of the movement that have some semantic meaning attached to them. So for instance, move towards the box, flip it up, um, move off the box or something like that. And for each of these little parts of the movement, we want to know, is it position controlled or is it force controlled? Is it relative to world coordinates or is it relative to the object? And then once we figure that out, um, so in this example here, while we're still moving towards the box in the air, force control obviously doesn't make any sense. And we always want to move towards the box, no matter where it is. Once we are in contact, we actually need to apply a force to stay in contact, but then the other direction is um, position control, um, for instance, in world coordinates and so forth. Once we figured that out, then it actually allows the robot to generalize also to new situations where we have different object positions and so forth. So the very rough idea behind that is that we look at if we have a converging or diverging behavior in the various dimensions. 
So for instance, if you take the initial part of the movement again as an example, so here, this part is the position data, and then we have it in world coordinates and in object coordinates. If you take a look in the object coordinates, because we're always moving towards the object, we get a, a converging behavior towards that object in this reference frame, while in world coordinates, it's diverging. So what we then said is, if we see this kind of converging behavior, that's the more likely to be the correct explanation rather than if you see a diverging behavior and we're going to assign this combination of reference frames and uh, control modalities for that part of the movement. So you get something like this uh, very roughly and then the best score is going to tell us which uh, combination to assign to that. And I get something like this, where it can generalize to different positions of the box. Um, you can also change the position of this part where it's flipping up against, uh, and it even generalizes to variations of the box shape. And then we can also apply that to slightly more uh, interesting tasks. So in this case, unscrewing and replacing a light bulb. Again, giving a few demonstrations. I need to unscrew the, so here using some kind of a caging behavior to um, move the light bulb and then put it in some kind of a trash. Up, uh, so here, what we additionally were considering is the transition conditions between the different primitives. So what's the sequence? And here, for instance, we have a loop that you want to do for the unscrewing behavior. And um, for instance, here, in order to stay in contact with the light bulb, we actually need to pull up slightly. So it's applying a force. And then if you can imagine that it, once the light bulb becomes loose, if you continue applying a force, it's going to accelerate and uh, throw the light bulb, which is something you totally don't want. So here it really needs to accurately learn when it becomes loose and then to very quickly switch to the next part of the movement of moving it to the trash. And here on top, you can see the different primitives it is executing at the moment. As I was saying in the beginning, as soon as we get uh, humans involved, that uh, becomes even more tricky. So one of the things uh, Xi Hong, my postdoc, is working on at the moment is trying to figure out how to use imitation learning to um, assist with dressing. Um, so here, the focus was really on using, in this case, only two demonstrations and then generating additional data algorithmically in order to be able to um, learn from very few demonstrations here. So here, uh, it's unfortunately covering up the, the number um, really from just two demonstrations and having a few additionally generated demonstrations that take into account the different uh, positions that the robots, uh, that the, the arm to be dressed can be in and using those reference frames to generate more data and then checking if that works or not allows us to very efficiently learn from as little human data as possible. Then uh, one other thing I wanted to show, again, with now really having a person in the loop is um, manipulating a heavy object uh, jointly with a robot. And here our focus was on trying to figure out how the robot can plan to enable the person to be as ergonomic as possible. So here you see a score, uh, lower is better, is more ergonomic, and then it's going to take this into account while planning the movement for the regrasping and, and the turning. So for instance here, um, it's moved the object higher because then uh, the, the human posture is going to be more ergonomic like that. And Urk, no, sorry. And what we get then in the end is that overall, the, um, the ergonomics of the 
person throughout the uh, task is better. But it turns out that humans are very unpredictable and they don't really care about ergonomics, uh, just do whatever they want. So we're now actually looking into, rather than trying to force people to be as ergonomic as possible to learn about their um, intentions and preferences and then having the robot um, conform to that to be more uh, agreeable to work with. So what's behind that? is a task model that's giving you the goal. Um, we have a planner that's coming up with the, the plan for the robot and how to move. It's also, this planner is also planning for the hand poses of the person, but just the poses of the, um, of the hands on the box. But in order to estimate the ergonomics, we actually need to know the full body pose of the person. So what we did there is, that we trained a um, machine learning uh, method to predict the pose a human is going to take according to where the hands are positioned. And that's actually personalized to everybody who did that experiment. And then additionally, we can estimate loads on the hands from the force measurements we got from the robot. And then obviously the remaining load needs to be on, on the human side. And with that, we can calculate the ergonomic score. And then in, again, this is used in the planner to come up with a sequence that allows a person to take ergonomic poses during this movement. So that's one way of having interactions with people for actually collaborating with them, doing tasks together. And what I'm going to talk about now for the rest of the talk is how to have interactions with a person during the learning process. So what's the idea of interactive learning? It's going to look a little bit like a reinforcement learning loop. Uh, so we have an agent, a robot, an environment, again, some form of a state, a policy, and which determines the action the robot takes. And that's the same as in the rollout reinforcement learning loop I've shown you. What we now have additionally is a teacher who is observing both the states and the actions and then can provide feedback. And most of the things I'm going to show you, that's going to be in the form of corrections as that turns out to be a lot easier for human teachers to do rather than providing full demonstrations. So providing saying, okay, move a bit more in that direction or change it a little bit in that direction rather than providing the correct action directly. So we can apply that to, to imitation learning, where here the idea is in a very schematic way, is we want to teach the uh, car in this case to drive on this side of the road, on the right side of the road. And then when the teacher observes that the robot is doing something wrong, it's going, the teacher is going to provide a correction. So move a bit to the left here. If you're outside, move a bit to the right and so forth. And then the robot is going to do this task multiple times and you're iteratively correcting that, you're occasionally jumping in when the uh, robot is doing something wrong, really with the idea that the robot is going to be, become more and more autonomous while you're injecting with that so that in the end it can do the task on its own. So that worked pretty well for um, low dimensional representations where we effectively have a direct state observations and then mapping to the actions. And then we also extended that to um, deep learning where you have uh, images as an input and then directly the commands as, as an output. Working with raw images also in this setting doesn't work very well. So we first tried the very obvious thing of using an autoencoder. So bring the raw images down to a latent representation that is compact and then operate on that. So you can the first thing you could try is, okay, I have some data of the task I want to do, uh, or maybe a, at least a related task. You pre-train this um, autoencoder 
and then effectively um, you use the encoder part and learn a policy on top of that low dimensional latent representation. And then either you completely freeze the encoder or um, you back propagate through the whole policy and encoder part. That works fairly well if you have sufficiently uh, representative data to train the, the autoencoder. But then the obvious question is, can't we just learn it at the same time and how much do we gain or lose from that so rather than do it sequentially pre-training the uh, latent representation and then learning a policy you can try to do it at the same time so you have again the encoder decoder structure you're reconstructing the input image and then at the same time we're learning the policy so here effectively the decoder is an auxiliary task uh, that is active at the same time as learning the control policy. So it looks something like that. What you're going to see on the left is the reconstruction of the latent space. And the task here is to push this little object from the table. So you can see that really very quickly, it learns also to reconstruct the uh, the image in the latent space, and then um, it takes some few minutes to interact with the robot. And as I was saying before, typically you have lots of interactions in the beginning because the robot doesn't know yet what to do. But once it has learned the latent representation and you've given some corrections, it can also do the policy autonomously. And then after 20 minutes or so, um, it can do it completely autonomously having learned both the latent representation and the policy from scratch. And I can also apply that to the driving example I was showing in the beginning. Again, here, that's the camera image and the reconstruction. And uh, Rodrigo here is uh, moving around with the robots and occasionally giving some corrections on, on the keyboard. And then here, if I skip forward a little bit, you're going to see that here he's going to let go of the, the robot. So then it really learned to drive on the right side of the road and to act based on the raw camera images. That's works well for simple control tasks where you only really care about the current image and that's sufficient to determine um, the action you need to take but for quite a lot of tasks you actually need more information than you have in a single image so uh, for instance if you want to have some form of velocity that you need to act on so that means you need some memory um, which usually means you include some memory in the neural network. So in this case, it's a recurrent structure with an LSTM. Um, so rather than using uh, a standard autoencoder, what we now decode to is not the original input, but one time step in the future. And then the policy again is learned based on this latent representation. So here are a few uh, toy examples, uh, very classical benchmark examples, mountain car and pendulum swing up. For instance, for the pendulum, you really need to know the velocity you're at in order to properly uh, control it and apply the action. And here in the middle, what you saw was um, again, the reconstruction. And you can apply different forms of interactive learning there. Um, Top one is our approach, the, uh, the one on the bottom is a pretty well-known alternative. We also tried it on a real little pendulum, um, learning from scratch. So um, here it's just taking 10 minutes or so, and then uh, we can evaluate it. Um, so what we're doing here is we're blocking it to show that it's really learned 
to control the pendulum from the images and not using some um, ground truth states. Right. Um, and here's a robotic example. What's important to know here is that the camera can only see this part in white here. So that's the camera input. Uh, the network input is just this slither here. So it needs to memorize where the objects are in order to be able to pick them up and touch them. And again, on the bottom here, what you see is the reconstruction of the internal representation. Here you can see, uh, Rodrigo giving some corrections um, and already after five minutes it's doing quite a good job at touching all the oranges and after 40-45 minutes or so it's improved even further and can really very accurately touch all those objects and predict where they're going. And what, what now the cool thing is if we have learned already a good latent representation for this task or for this family of tasks. If we extend it, so now we are trying to introduce an additional object, so the pairs which it's supposed to avoid. Um, this pre trained representation and policy allow it to very quickly learn to adjust to that. So really after three minutes, it can adapt to this new task. And then again, if we continue, training it a bit further, um, it takes 10 minutes or so until we converge to the final performance. What I've shown you so far was giving corrections directly in the action space, um, which is obviously very direct. So you can have full control over the robot but it's also potentially very high dimensional. And especially if you want to have non-robotics experts teach a robot, that can be rather non-intuitive. So what you could do instead is provide the corrections and have the interactions directly in state space. So uh, not provide the joint angles, but rather the correct something in the position of the end effector. The obvious disadvantage of that is that you need some form of an inverse model that, that maps it back to the joints which you need to control the robot. So what you're going to see here is an approach where we learn at the same time um, an inverse model of the robot and the, uh, the policy. So the task here is to use the laser pointer, which you can also see here in a bit larger, to track uh, an object or a shape in on the whiteboard. So it's not just a standard inverse model you would have a robot, but it's actually you need to learn also the how the laser pointer and the, the board interact. And also here within 10 minutes or so we can learn both the policy and the the model we need to control the robot. And they are just for as a demonstration, we are tracking core, which is an abbreviation for the department I'm part of. And so, so far, what I've shown you was really purely controlling kinematics, so positions and velocities. But if you think back about what I was showing you in the first part of the talk, if you want to have more interesting interactions with the environment, you actually also need to consider forces when interacting with the environment. So what we try to do there is learning both the stiffness and the trajectory of um, a movement. So what we did here is that we started with a kinesthetic demonstration, so moving the robot around to give a rough uh, demonstration, use uh, a Gaussian process to in, uh, encode both the shape and the stiffness. And then we again, we use interactive corrections in this case with the space mouse to um, fine tune the movement. And that's correcting both the uh, trajectory and the stiffness or the forces. Mm, come on. So here's an example, a uh, very typical wiping a whiteboard. Uh, we provide a few demonstrations of the movement. 
But if you just play that back and you don't have any idea on the force you need to apply, then it won't properly erase. So if you use impedance control like we have here, what you actually need to do is to move the target position a bit below the surface. And Anna, uh, who's now also one of my PhD students, was not just now providing some corrections on how to modify the uh, behavior, so effectively pushing it down more. Um, and then it can interactively, through these corrections, learn to wipe the board within a few minutes. Um, why is it now again the same thing? Okay, sorry, that was just uh, the same video twice. So what you see here is um, it's going A, B, C, D. So starting from there, going over, up, and uh, then down again. So here we're both modifying the trajectory. The original demonstrations are the red dots here. And then the final trajectory, which is doing this nice loop, is uh, the line in black, which we corrected. And what you additionally see in the background is the amount of force it's applying. So initially, it's not going to apply any force at all. But then through these adaptations and also by adapting the stiffness, you can learn that really here while we are in contact with the, the, uh, with the whiteboard, you need to apply a force in order to clean properly. And what we have overall here with the little arrows is kind of a vector representation of the movement. So uh, the vectors tell you if you're here, you're supposed to move there. So it's also having an attractor behavior towards the nominal trajectory the robot is supposed to follow. So if you disturb it, it's just going to converge back to that behavior. Here's another example. In this case, the task was to try to pick up the object in one smooth movement without actually stopping to grasp, but rather to do it in one swoop and then pick it up. Uh, what we did here was to provide an initial demonstration that is pretty slow and still safe for people to do. And now we are using these interactive corrections to both slightly modify the trajectory um, so the object doesn't fall over, but we also have an additional modality that allows us to speed up the, the movement so it can really do it. Um, in a very fluent and quick manner. And we, for these kind of tasks, we also are trying it out with um, some non-robotic experts and seeing if the um, if users also really find it intuitive to teach um, a robot this task. So here, uh, that's the task we use more or less for the user study. Again, with the idea to initially provide a demonstration and then separately modify the trajectory and the velocity. We compared that against um, having a user just uh, correct everything in one go without considering the uh, positions and the velocity separately. The good news is that uh, all our users managed to do the task, so to pick it up fluently and actually speed it, get it to the desired speed. Uh, we were hypothesizing that the um, uh, users are very much going to prefer to be able to adjust things uh, individually and only to concentrate on one thing. Turns out that there are actually two different groups of people, at least in the sample of users we had. One group really strongly preferred to try to teach everything in one go and just use corrections of the trajectory to also speed it up, while the other group really strongly preferred to um, do the corrections of the positions uh, of, and the trajectory and speeding it up separately. But um, that's not too bad 
just tells us that uh, apparently there won't be a one size fits all teaching and learning method for um, all the, the users we might have. To come back to the example I was showing in the beginning were the imitation learning and the different reference frames and these ambiguities. Here's another example. If we provide a number of demonstrations about moving towards a cup that is always on a coaster, um, maybe the, the robot can figure out that it's supposed to be relative to the cup or the coaster. But if you separate the cup and the coaster, then the robot suddenly doesn't know any longer if it's supposed to move relative to the coaster or to the cup. So either you burden the person doing the teaching with considering all the possible combinations that allow a robot to disambiguate what's important and what's not important beforehand and provide sufficient demonstrations. Or what we try to do here is again to have it interactively. So if a robot doesn't know any longer what to do because it encounters an ambiguous situation, then it's going to ask for help and have the teacher provide additional information or in this case uh, feedback in order to resolve that. And what the nice, very nice, cool thing about that is, is that in quite many situations it actually doesn't matter. So even if the robot doesn't know if it's supposed to move relative to the cup or the coaster, as long as they're sub together, it, in terms of the movement it's going to execute, that's always going to be the same. So actually we don't need to bother the, uh, the teacher with a question. So that's exactly what our approach is taking into account, thinking it's reasoning about, okay, um, do I know what to do in this uh, situation? Um, if not, then I'm going to ask the user. And um, once we have gotten the feedback, then we rem remember that. And for future um, instances of the situation, we're going, just going to use the strategy we learned. So here in this example, we already provided some demonstrations on how to put the cucumber in uh, the crate. If you change the position of the cucumber, that still works. Now we swap the two crates and it doesn't know any longer if it's supposed to move relative to the crate or to the uh, table. And it's uh, and here we just provide one push in the right direction and figure it out. Here's another example of uh, what happens if you change the shape. Is it supposed to put it uh, still where it was before or is it actually somewhere in the middle and here you see a user study about stacking some boxes of tea in the correct order and also here um, depending on what it has seen before in the demonstration it might encounter some examples where it doesn't know any longer what to do we have compared that to plain kinesthetic demonstrations where you really have to think beforehand on which combinations you need to show and to, to demonstrate all that so that the robot can purely reason based on the demonstrations what the correct sequence and combinations are. Now we compare that to um, using this interactive modality where you just provide one demonstration in the beginning and then uh, it's trying, the robot is trying to do its best and when it's answered, it's going to ask for additional input. Then if you ask the, the users which one you prepare, they prefer here KT is kinesthetic teaching where you have to provide all the demonstrations and Vira is our interactive learning paradigm. So they found in general that having the possibility of teaching a robot interactively and kind of incrementally to be a lot less demanding and also a uh, lot less frustrating and requiring a lot less um, effort from the users. So the final thing I promised to show you is a ball in a cup, but now with a teacher in the loop. What you could do in the simplest setting is say, okay, I'm going to use some interactive learning to first roughly learn it. And then I only use reinforcement learning to, to fine tune that. 
But what we here again try to do is to do it simultaneously to have the reinforcement learning and the interactive learning at the same time. So very roughly how it works is that's the same uh, figure I was showing you before. Uh, but what we have additionally is exploration. So the robot needs to try new things in order to figure out the best strategy. And here we model the human advice as a form of exploration. Um, so effectively, if a human is jumping in, then uh, the human is taking over control. We model it as a form of new experience in the which is equivalent to exploration. And then we can use a more or less standard uh, policy search reinforcement learning approach. So it looks like this. Um, now we're really able to start from scratch. So without an initial um, kinesthetic demonstration, uh, what you can see is Carlos uh, sitting in front of the robot and providing some corrections uh, with the keyboards to move more to the left, to move more to the right, move faster, move slower, these kind of things. And then after 25 trials or so, uh, the robot really has learned from scratch to catch the ball in the cup. So here, two plots, just to give you an impression. If here, if we do it still with an initial demonstration, in red is the pure reinforcement learning, and in green and blue are the interactive learning approaches. If we don't use reinforcement learning, the final performance here in green is a bit worse. Um, but you can see that already in this case, it's significantly faster to have a human in the loop. And it becomes even more drastic if we are really learning from scratch and they're using pure reinforcement learning takes uh, about 10 times as long as having a human in the loop. So to sum up what uh, my group is working on is trying to figure out how to best make use of human expertise while a robot is learning to really make teaching a robot a new skill, child's play. To sum up, um, I think that for having robots in our daily lives, it's very important to go from programming to teaching robots. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a combination of learning from teachers, from humans, but also having robots able to be learned on their own it means they need to somehow understand both the environment and the humans. Many of the uh, typical deep learning approaches you see really rely on big data. Unable data tends to be cheap. Annotated data is a lot more expensive. And if you have then real world interactions where you can damage stuff that suddenly becomes really expensive which is the case in robotics. So our approach to make that tractable is by combining learning and teaching paradigms and trying to incorporate prior knowledge to, in order to speed up the learning process. So that's it from my side. And I'd be more than happy to take questions, uh, either put them in the chat or uh, unmute yourselves. Professor Kober, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions, please? Well, then I suppose that people learned uh, most of these things that they were very exciting. Uh, typically, you know, I hate the chair making questions. Uh, <laughs> But in this particular case, we have some genuine interest. As I've told you, uh, we try to 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 learn uh, uh, drone cinematography. Basically, uh, when you have a target, like like let's say a car or an athlete, and you yep. want to make, to, to make the the drone moving to orbit around the moving car, mm -hmm. then you, you you either know the dynamics and the kinematics, and you you program it somehow, or you learn it from examples. <laughs> yeah, to learn it through reinforcement learning. So that's uh, what we try to do now. We have some difficulties. We have found some fairly good results, but we, we continue working in this topic. Do you think that uh, this approach of yours, making also humans in the loop can work? I, I would hope so. I, mean, I would need to see the, the details of the problem, but um, in general, 
I believe that this idea of having the humans in the loop combines the best of both worlds in the sense that people are extremely good at providing the kind of the high level ideas to the rough guidance of what a robot needs to do. While a robot, if it's doing reinforcement learning, it's, it's extremely good at doing things uh, reproducibly, repeatedly, and actually fine tuning its, its behavior. Um, so, yeah. And um, if you... There are two questions in the chat. Yeah. Okay, nice. Uh, like, so let's start with the first one. Sylvia, um, did we include counterfactual examples into the learning process or also contrastive uh, examples? Uh, no, so the, the things I showed you today, they mainly, they, they really were focusing on um, having the robot do the, the right thing, or if it's doing a wrong thing, then, then effectively you try to pull it back to the, uh, to the right uh, trajectory in the simplest case. But yeah, that's indeed something uh, we're planning to, to look into if we can get um, more information out of actually also including these kind of uh, examples in the learning process. Um, and then Nikolai, how do you, um, yes, uh, so yeah, uh, let me just reply to Sylvia's second question then for, because that's, I think, very quick to answer. So yes, we've also tried uh, some inverse reinforcement learning approaches with uh, having a person in the loop and there, yes, you get these kind of um, contrastive and counterfactual uh, examples. Um, Nikolai, how do you see the future of learning from demonstration industrial settings, such as teaching a robot to tend a CNC machine or weld parts together? So it really depends on, on what you want to do or what the environment is or what the setting is in the sense that if it's going to be essentially the same trajectory uh, all the time, then just having a robot replay it and having some little corrections maybe on top of it, that, that's pretty uh, easy to do with the, the tools we have nowadays. So you could effectively just uh, record a trajectory and play it back in the simplest case. What becomes a lot more interesting is if it needs to deal with variations in the task. So if you have uh, quite a lot of different parts that are coming in that you're supposed to weld together. And then the question is, do you want to have a person always providing an additional demonstration whenever a new tool comes in or a new part, I mean, comes in, or do you actually want to also take the, for instance, a cut data into account uh, and need to incorporate that somehow into the learning process mm -hmm. that you can be able to, to generalize more autonomously to, to a larger extent uh, to different um, variations in the tasks and, and the parts. Uh, sorry for that, yes. I think it's quite difficult for the speaker both to read the chat and reply. Sure. So please <laughs> voice up your questions. So there is a question by um, um, Pablo and then uh, by Nikolai and Francois. Just voice up, please, your questions. So I can make a question. Sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I noticed that writing down and you read it is not uh, very social. So <laughs> So thanks for the talk, uh, Jens. Uh, amazing work, actually. To see the, the boat moving is very nice. Uh, I was thinking that um, probably you have any work on that, that uh, where the, it's actually the robot that also correct the human to achieve the goal. So right now you only have the human correcting the robot, but I assume that you can have a joint goal or arrive to a, like when you have this kind of coordination of 
that you, they have to push the one object both at the same time. So I, yes. you have uh, tried this kind of uh, joint goal or that the robot corrects the humans. Yes, uh, yeah, it's something we're working on at the moment. Um, so yeah, indeed, with these kind of collaborative manipulation tasks, then you get the typical questions about who should be the leader, who should be the follower. Uh, the, the robot might need to nudge the, the human because of some constraints or, or whatever. Um, so, and then you can even push it further if you're thinking about, I don't know, rehabilitation settings, stuff. but that's not something uh, I'm working on. Um, yeah, so so indeed that's, so we are trying to approach it also from some kind of an inverse reinforcement learning approach and trying to figure out um, how to combine the sort of the reward functions or the optimization criteria of the of the robot uh, and the person and also trying to figure out when does the human actually want the robot to to take the lead okay thanks so looking forward those words thanks uh, another question please So Francois wrote, he can't put his mic on. What is your thought about skill representation and composition? How can we teach skill that can be leveraged in more complex skills without relearning from scratch? Uh, yes, I have a related question on this. Uh, did you envisage any incremental learning? For example, you learn a thing and then you continue learning other things without forgetting the old ones, and uh, can you comment on the capacity of these systems about so how many different actions can you learn at the same time? Good question. Um, so incremental learning, especially if you're talking about neural networks, unfortunately always is a bit tricky with the, the networks tending to forget once you start teaching it something new. Um, so yes, we, we've worked on trying to figure out what you actually need to kind of keep repeating so it uh, remembers sufficiently to do the old tasks. Um, then the other question is, do you really want to represent it as a gigantic neural network that is able to do multiple tasks? Or are you actually going for a more hierarchical setting. And at the moment, we're more looking into the second um, approach where you have uh, a kind of a lower level representation of um, simpler skills, what I call motor skills or tasks, and then having an additional layer on top of that that actually learns how to Chain them and maybe slightly modify them in order to build up a more complex skill um, using these uh, these kind of components it has already learned. Um, yeah. So hope that answers that question. Um, who else? Uh, there is a question by Ioana Georgi. Okay, I don't know, I'll just read it. Uh, do you consider language for interactive learning as a more natural way for humans to provide feedback? Um, yes, we've, um, we've considered it. We haven't uh, really done experiments with it yet. If you just um, want to do very simple things like um, saying yes, no, that's uh, going to be not too difficult to implement. If you're talking about feedback to uh, with language where you really tell the robots move uh, a bit more to the left or something than just from the uh, um, processing of the verbal instructions to, to getting some and translating that to feedback for the policy is probably quite challenging. And indeed, that's something 
have uh, been working now on on actually trying to not only look from the more from the human at uh, robot point of view or the machine learning point of view what's the best way of uh, getting information in but really also uh, doing very focused user studies on how do people like to give feedback so uh, we now looked at different forms of feedback so whether it's corrections or giving kind of an evaluative feedback on um, is it was good or bad and then indeed uh, really the interface whether it's clicking a button or um, doing kinesthetic teaching or using speech uh, that's one of the things we want to look into uh nikolai yes uh, not yet but uh, we're going to uh, put some more stuff um, on github pretty soon hopefully um, some of the stuff is already um, online if you go to my website i have a um a sub page on software or whatever it's called where you can find some of the stuff um there are more messages no i think that's all uh, okay thank you very much jens for your uh, very nice talk and uh, also the discussion that follows uh, I, I just get two things two or three things i would like to tell you and the audience first of all um, you know, if you want, I can, uh, we can talk together offline in Skype with my students regarding these drone control problems. That's thing number one. Uh, thing number two is that we have recently done research on, um, or started doing research on knowledge quantification, believe it or not. Uh, it, it, our society is a knowledge-based society, but we don't have any mathematical definition of knowledge, and we don't know how to quantify it. We don't know uh, what the DNNs know, and uh, we focused our uh, survey work so far on uh, DNN knowledge. But uh, same things also apply to procedural knowledge, like the ones that you learn with robots. So how can you quantify the knowledge there? So how can you quantify the capacity of uh, uh, of uh, these systems that uh, do uh, to learn uh, procedurally, uh, and, and this comes to my next thing. We organize uh, the so-called AI melodology workshop, which is a futuristic workshop about uh, uh, what's hot on AI. We've done it last year through IDA and AI for Media. We are going to do it this year again. So uh, we can cooperate into defining such a challenge and uh, we can, you can also define and other people also can define their own challenges. For example, you can define technical or scientific challenges on, um, um, on reinforcement learning and robotics, for example. Uh, there's no need to have competitions. It, it can be a little bit more theoretical and maybe you know, you can attract two or three people from all over the world that have a similar interest to your students. And then you can have an international team working in this area around this, uh, the, your challenge. Uh, essentially, you know, Hilbert defined uh, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, the Hilbert uh, challenges for mathematics that have driven mathematics for almost a century. So we could try to do the same. Um, so if you or somebody else is interested in defining challenges and raising discussion, first of all, around those challenges, you are welcome to do so. Um, and uh, also in IDA, we try to, to, to find people like uh, that are young and, and, and energetic and knowledgeable that are willing to act as AI seniors. So for example, suppose that you become an AI senior on uh, machine learning and robotics. So essentially you can maintain those challenges and we can maintain in IDA, in the IDA webpage, um, uh, some literature, basic literature on this topic. And you try to, to build a small community of researchers, advanced researchers on this topic. I think it's a good idea. So if you, if you or somebody else is interested either in defining challenges or in contributed in, in the AI melodology workshop. Um, 
uh, or if your university is interested in becoming made uh, IDA member, it's possible. So please send me a message. And of course, Jens, we're going to be in touch for the follow-ups. Uh, any more question or proposal or comment? If there is none, then thank you very much. Bye here from Greece. And um, I look forward to see you in uh, another, at least another uh, lecture by Professor uh, uh, Peters from Technical University of Darmstadt in a month or so on more or less similar topics. Bye.